My name is Pam Bosch. I'm a professor of physical therapy at Northern Arizona University. And along with Heather Hayes and Dana Call, we have been working on answering a very interesting clinical question that came in recently. The question was, is there evidence for or, or against the use of hemiwalkers for gait training in the acute phase post-stroke? So like any good clinical practitioner, we wanted to take an evidence-based approach to this. And we thought we would start by looking at research evidence about this topic. In order to do an appropriate search, we enlisted the help of a librarian to form our search strategy. And despite the sophisticated assistance that she provided, we did only return a few studies, um, one that was considered a higher level of evidence, which is the citation listed here. So essentially, these researchers wanted to compare energy expenditure among adults with hemiplegia while using either a single point cane, a quad cane, or a hemi walker. And so to answer their question, they enlisted 30 adults who had chronic gait deficits from stroke, but could walk 10 meters independently. They had the individuals come on three separate days and complete a six minute walk test using a portable um, gas analysis system while walking with each of the three devices. So they found that while energy expenditure was lower with both the quad cane and hemi walker than it was with a single point cane, the overall energy cost, so considering the walk distance and the velocity of walking, the um, single point cane performed better than the quad cane or the hemi walker. So this provided us with limited evidence um, and we want to be mindful of the fact that we can also look at clinical resources that inform us. And we did find a little bit of information on both of these sites, EBRSR and the Stroke Engine, addressing um, aspects of gait or the use of um, a hemi walker. In addition, we were interested in understanding how clinical experience informs one's decision. And so we wanted to speak with a clinician with expertise in NCS and a student who um, could weigh in on a case. And here's the case. So this individual was a 55-year-old male with obesity who was receiving outpatient physical therapy for deficits from a middle cerebral artery hemorrhagic stroke on the right side that he had sustained about three years prior. When he initially had his stroke, he did not have insurance, but he still was able to receive both inpatient rehab and home health services. Um, about a year post-stroke, he received outpatient physical therapy, and at this point in time, presented to another outpatient clinic. The patient was able to walk a maximum distance of 30 feet that required minimal assistance using a hemi walker. Walking did need to stop at that point because of fatigue and also right knee pain, which the patient did not have before the stroke. Um, the gait speed for his 10 meter walk test was 0 0.28 meters per second. The individual does not wear an AFO, though he has a carbon fiber brace, but he doesn't like it and claims that he doesn't know where it is. He walks with a step two gait. In um, a couple minutes, you'll see a video of a patient with a similar pattern. It is not the exact patient of this case. Socially, the patient is being cared for by an elderly parent who's the primary caregiver, and the patient has very limited social contacts, which were worsened by the COVID pandemic. Uh, health literacy is reduced overall for this family. A couple other points about this patient is that he has 
persistent deficits on the left side, including left inattention, left upper and lower extremity hemiparesis with increased flexor tone in the arm and extensor tone in the leg. Additionally, he lacks insights into his own deficits. The upper extremity is positioned in flexor synergy, but he is able to use a grasp and release, and he can hold the handles of a light gate or a heavy duty rolling walker. Regardless of uh, walking mode, he does require minimal assistance for walking. His goal is to walk independently in his home. Hi, I am Dr. Dana Kale. I'm an assistant professor at Arkansas Colleges of Health Education. Um, I teach the neuro content here, and I am lucky to be here with my student, Summerin Willie. Um, Summerin, I'm excited to have you here and have a conversation with you. So could you take a second to introduce yourself? Thank you, Dr. Kale. I'm excited to be here with you, too. I'm Summerin Willie. I'm a second year PT student, and I'm from Jonesboro, Arkansas. So Considering the case that was just presented to you, could you tell me what are the impairments of body structure and function um, that you might want to consider in your decision making for what type of assistive device this patient should need? Yes. So since the patient had a stroke, I would definitely think about how the patient would have left sided weakness because of this. So that would be important when, when picking a device. I also would think about the type of or how much balance or stability that they already have so, cause, because that would influence the base of support that they would need. And I would also think about how he's not aware of his deficits. So that may be a safety concern for him being at an increased risk of falls. And then I also would think about how he's been complaining of having knee pain. And what are the functional limitations that you might want to consider? Well, the main one definitely is his walking. So the hemi walker that he is using is getting in the way of him being able to advance and, and, and walk as fast in the community. He was walking at a, two, a 0.28 meters per second when he did his 10 meter walk test, which that is very slow. Walking definitely was the main functional limitation. And then he also will have functional limitation with doing his ADLs because his balance also isn't as good neither. And what about the participation level limitations that you might want to consider? I definitely would still want to look at his walking because him walking so slow will affect him being able to go out in the community and with him walking as slow as he is, he'll more than likely will have to go out in the community in a, in a wheelchair. Let's consider the patient's desires. Does that, um, how does that influence your decision in what assistive device you might use? So I definitely would want to work on his balance because he is wanting to independently do everything that he can around his own home. And I definitely would work on him effectively using his Hemi Walker if he decides to keep using it. That way he's able to effectively move around the house and he's not having to take as many steps and getting tired out because he's having to take shorter steps because his Hemi Walker is getting in the way of his unaffected leg. And what might be a long-term plan for this patient? Long-term plan, what I would want to try is Instead of using the Hemi Walker, I would want to try maybe something like a rolling walker because the Hemi Walker is slowing him down. And if he was to use a rolling walker, that would encourage him to use his left side, which is the affected side, 
because that's what we want to do. We don't want him to get even weaker because he's not using that side. So using a rolling walker would encourage him to use his left side also. And it also would help him with his knee pain that he's already having. Very good. All right. Well, thank you very much for your insight. I appreciate it. Yes, of course. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Hi, so my guest is my colleague, Dr. Kim Gatewood, who is a neuroclinical specialist with over 40 years of experience in um, neuro rehab and really multiple areas of physical therapy practice. And we have reviewed the case um, that we're discussing. So what... Um, maybe what impairments in particular would you consider in your, in your decision making and maybe um, address some of the functional limitations that you would want to consider? Okay, well, first of all, um, of course, the left inattention started wanting to do a lot of forced use of that left side upper and lower extremity because I am a firm believer that physical therapists who are need to also address the upper extremity, not just leave it to the OTs. Um, it's good that he has a little um, grip in his hand, so we might be able to utilize that to help him improve his gait. Um, I am concerned with, uh, um, he had an AFO, so obviously at one point they thought that he needed that AFO. So I really want to look at his ankle. Um, with a step two gait, I want to figure out what's causing that. So I would look closely at his ankle dorsiflexion, um, measure it in subtalar neutral with the, both the knee flex and extended, um, and then look at, um, we don't have any information about his left leg. So I want to really look at the function of that leg. Um, is he stuck um, in with fractionated movement deficits? Um, is he able to uh, dorsiflex that ankle at heel strike? And, um, um, I, I'm also concerned about his uh, cardiovascular status, being that he's had a stroke. We know mm -hmm. he has cardiovascular issues, and um, he's only walking 30 feet, uh, limited by right knee pain. So not only do we have to address the cardiovascular issues and make sure that, you know, during treatment, we're assessing his blood pressure, his heart rate, um, his O2 sets, his response to intensity, because I'll talk about it, the intensity of treatment in just a little bit with him. But we also um, need to look at that knee. Sure. You know, even though we, I'm a neurospecialist, can't uh, ignore yeah. those orthopedic sure. issues. So I want to do a thorough assessment of that right knee and Absolutely. figure out what's causing the pain. Um, it could just be, maybe it's how he's walking. So I really want to look at his gait and analyze his gait a little further. So those are some of the impairments that um, I would address right off the get-go with him. And then maybe thinking about um, more specifically about participation level restrictions. Is there anything from that perspective that you would consider? Yes, I'm really concerned about his isolation. So I would refer him to a stroke support group, maybe, you know, look what other um, things there are in the community. Maybe he could get into an exercise class in the community. Um, in the past, I've also taken some people like him to a gym myself mm -hmm. and then set up a program that then a trainer could follow through with um, mm -hmm. to take some of that off of the thing that I have to do with him. Sure. I'm really worried about his mom because if he's 55, she's got to be in her 70s. Yeah. So, in, you know, she's providing minimal assistance with gait. I don't know if it's minimal assistance with his transfers also. So um, the first thing I want to make sure is that she's not having to help him with transfers and all that. Sure. And assess his ability to get onto and off the toilet, into and out of the shower, um, make sure that he can do that. And that he can do that safely Sure. to take her out of the picture for those little things, which that would also enable him a little more freedom if he's independent with all of that to do social activities outside of his home. Mm -hmm. I kind of want to just come back to the specific question from the clinician about um, 
I mean, the question was about evidence for or against the use of Hemi walkers. And as you've noted, there's very little. Mm -hmm. So what in your clinical experience would drive you to choose that device or another one for this individual? Um, for somebody who needs that greater stability in order to be safe with walking, because ultimately we don't want him to fall. That's going to send him into the hospital and probably upset his caregiver a lot. Um, so we, he has to be safe and the caregiver has to feel confident working with him. It's um, then, you know, like a walker is another consideration I think about to make him use that hand a little bit. Mm -hmm. I am grateful for your time. Thanks so much for weighing in on this. Well, thanks for asking me. Sure. Sure.